Okay, today's class, uh, and I changed the <coughs> subtitle, is Style, How to Speak. I struggle a little bit with how best to describe this. In, um, in Latin, it's elocutio. Um, the, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, it really is, we've talked about selecting your topic based upon who your audience is and what you think they need to hear and all of that. We've talked about organizing your presentation, <coughs> and that's sermon or, we use the example of a sermon, sermon or teaching. Um, but then, once you've got the topic, once you know who your audience is, once you have a sense of where you're going with it, um, you have a sense of organization, how you're going to organize this in a way that, that is most effective, what do you actually say? How do you choose your words? And there are several factors related to that. Uh, the <laughs> words that you choose to speak are related to the audience and the, the circumstance, etc. We're going to look at a couple of those things again that we talked about briefly. But that's what we're going to deal with today, is the style, which is the translation for elocutio, the Latin term for this, this part. Um, but it really means the style of your speech. What, how do you choose your words and then how do you present those words? Um, we are not going to have a class next week. I have decided that because I need to get caught up on some things, I need to also prepare the what you need to know from communications analytics, and I've had a couple of other people say that they really could, could use the extra time to catch up on the reading and things. We will not have class next week, um, which is really fine because a number of the terms recently, the classes have been seven week classes. I set this up as an eight week <coughs> term, but so uh, I'm going to take one of those next week and give you guys a chance to catch up and give me a chance to catch up, so we will have a, a midterm break next week. <laughs> And we will come back and pick up the last two pieces of the rhetoric, memory, and delivery, and then applying the principles at the final meeting on the 19th. My goal will be to try to have, by taking next week off, to have the What You Need to Know document done by two weeks from today, so that you will have that study. Okay? Any questions about that? Makes sense? And that's true for all the classes. We'll not be meeting next week, but then we'll just come back two weeks from today. All right, um, this is the basic outline that I gave you, the five canons or principles of rhetoric. This started with Aristotle and then was carried on. Aristotle actually, he said there were two main points and then he added two others, an introduction and a conclusion, but he really began this. He later got picked up by the Latin, um, the Latin scholars and rhetoric became one of the basic liberal arts. Rhetoric was part of the trivium, the three easier of the, what they consider the liberal arts. And so they had very clear instructions. And until very recent times, rhetoric was one of the most basic, one of the basic things that everyone got taught in school. And it basically means how to communicate persuasively. And we've lost that. I once had a great nephew of mine. It was funny, I, I was working as a consultant. This was before I was a pastor. And our great nephews who were adopted would come up and visit us uh, from time to time, and one of them came up for a long weekend, and, and we sat down. I took him to breakfast, and he said, you know, Ross, I, I, you seem to have plenty of money, but I don't ever see you working. What do you do? <laughs> um, and I told him I was a consultant, you know, that this is, this is what I did. That, um, and uh, he said, that's what I want to do. And I said, well, it's not quite that easy. You don't just decide that you're going to do this. I said, I've been, I've been doing the work I do for 25 years at that point. Um, to give me the background and the training to be able to be a consultant. And at that point, I told him what I believe is the truth here and why, why rhetoric used to be the stand, one of the standard things everyone was taught. And that is whatever you go into, though it doesn't matter what you go into, you also should focus a significant part of your, of your energy on making sure you learn to communicate well. And that is in speech and in writing. Because you can be the smartest guy in the whole block and if you can't communicate that to anybody, it doesn't help you any. You could be the sharpest worker in your business. And if you don't have, a, if you have not trained yourself to communicate that effectively to your bosses, they're never going to know that. They're not going to promote you for it. So whatever else it is you do, the ability to communicate effectively and persuasively is critical to that. So that's what that was my little teaching moment for our great nephew. Um, and rhetoric is part of what it was the discipline that people used to all learn about how to communicate. The five canons of rhetoric, invention, meaning what do you need to uh, want or need to say and why do you need to say it. Arrangement, 
how do I structure and organize my message to best communicate with this particular audience? We talked about that last week, so we've dealt with those two. Today, style. What, what, by what approach can I best communicate this particular message to this particular audience? Next time we meet in two weeks, we will talk about memory. How can I be best prepared to effectively deliver this message to this audience? And then finally, delivery. In practical terms, how can I best present this message? Today, we want to focus on the third of the five canons, which is style, or to use the Latin, elocutio. By what approach can I best communicate this message to this audience? Basically, what should I say and how do I say it? Based upon what I think they need to hear and how, what I want to communicate to them. What words um, do I choose in order to best communicate my message? And how do I speak those words in order to be most effective? So that they get it and they are persuaded by what I have to say. Um, style is what this usually is translated by, elocutio. It is where the uh, word elocutio is where we get the word elocution. But for many people, if they even know or use the word elocution, it tends to mean sort of flighty, highfalutin kind of talk. That's not what it meant originally. It simply meant to be very intentional about what words you use and how you present them in order to be effective in communicating that. Um, in particular, they would talk about in the original rhetoric training, the Latin rhetoric training, that you had to decide what uh, level of style you were going to use. What they meant by that is they talked about plain, medium, or high, or florid. And they would say different circumstances call for you plain speaking, meaning not overly emotional or overly dramatic. That would be more appropriate for a teaching kind of situation. A, a middle, or what they call robusta approach, would be probably a speaking kind of thing, where you're, not, you're using plain language, but you're doing it with some energy. And then the third of those, what they call high style, or florida, or gravis, to use the Latin words, that's when you're trying to be charming, when you're using colorful language and po poetic kinds of expressions. Um, and that's what you would do if you were in a very charming company and you were trying to impress them. So there's different levels of this style um, that would be required. And we're going to talk about there were four ingredients that you also have to decide about. Correctness, clearness, appropriateness, and ornament. And we're going to get into each one of those in a few minutes. But first I want to give you a reminder of something, we, a couple of things we talked about earlier. You remember I gave you six initial points that you needed to be concerned with. This is just the first three, but I'm giving these to you again because each of these, thinking about these, affect the vocabulary, the tone, the rate of speech, the way you emphasize your words. In other words, the style you use, how you choose to speak, and the words you choose to speak are affected by these same things we talked about as your first step. These are the things I said you need to think about when you're focused, when you're deciding what's your topic. You know, what, what is your message? And, you know, what, and those things were, what are you being called on to do? There is a different style, different vocabulary, different tone, uh, different rate of speech in a sermon, homily or meditation versus teaching, or a devotional, a class, a course, a lecture, an introduction, a eulogy, a toast, a continuing series of things. Each of the way you build those with language, the style, what you choose to say, will differ based upon what you're trying to do. A eulogy will not be presented in the same way as if you're asked to be giving an inspiring speech to a, to a social organization. It's going to be a different vocabulary, different rate, etc. For whom of you are you being asked to do it? Congregation, Sunday school, class, Bible study group, community group, etc. Um, that will make a huge difference. I once made the mistake with like a third, or third and fourth grade Sunday school class deciding I was going to explain to them the difference in sin with a big S, mean, meaning to choose away from, against God, and sins with a small S, which meant the specific bad things that we do, did not go over. Because I had made a really bad call in terms of how my elocute, how I was going to elocute you, my, the style I was going to present to them. And the audience, I really missed because I was using something inappropriate for that audience. So the audience makes a difference for whom you're being asked to do it. And then what do you think they need to hear most? A message that inspires, comforts, challenges, uh, disciples, disciplines, encourages, exhorts, etc. Your vocabulary and especially the tone, the speed, 
how you modulate your voice are all going to be different depending upon what you're trying to accomplish with it. So we've talked about some of those things before, but in particular, the words, tone, rate, the way you speak are affected by these things as well as what you feel you ought to be saying. Is that clear? Um, there's a, the sophists, who were some of the early rhetoricians, uh, they had a, a comment, what is to be said must conform to both audience and occasion. That's everything I'm saying about this. What is to be said must conform to both audience and occasion. Who you're talking to and what the situation is that you're speaking at. So, this affects style. Another thing we looked at before that comes in here, uh, this is a reminder of something we talked about earlier, but it's primarily under elocutio or style that things come in, the three types of rhetoric proofs or the things that people will, will perceive that will give them either they'll agree with you, be persuaded or not. Um, the first one is ethos. I said earlier, you will remember that these were like the three musketeers, ethos, pathos, and logos. Um, ethos, how the character and credibility of speaker can influence an audience to consider him or her to be believable. Now one of that is visually. What's your appearance? How do you appear to them? But then, whether you seem intelligent, moral, of good reputation, trustworthy, etc., will have a lot to do with what words you choose and how you present them. Your vocabulary, what vocabulary someone has is one of the strongest indicators that people receive of whether or not they think they're intelligent. And so, not only how you appear, your vocabulary, the quality of your voice, your rate of speech, etc. A lot of studies have been done that have shown that people think someone is more intelligent and more trustworthy if they speak faster than if they speak slower. It's like they're more believable. You wouldn't think so because you'd think, oh, those fast talking salesmen kind of guys. Um, well, I come from the South and I don't speak like most of the people in the South. <laughs> They tend to be very slow. I worked in tourism actually with the state of Kentucky for a while. I was in a private thing, but we worked with the state, uh, state <coughs> tourism bit for And the head of tourism, very sharp guy, really sharp guy. Uh, and, and yet, he talked like this, mm -hmm. very slow. And he's, he had a, a Kentucky accent. And he said to me one time, he said, you know, because his job involved a lot of interaction with <clears throat> people in federal government to promote tourism in the states and also other states, and et cetera. And he said to me once, in his drawl, he said, I love it when people hear me talk and they assume that I must be kind of slow, which is what they assume. Because he said, that gives me an advantage. Because he was a very sharp guy, he just didn't sound like it. People do evaluate your intelligence, the trustworthiness of what you have to say, whether or not they're going to be persuaded, based upon how you speak. And studies have demonstrated that over and over and over again. Um, that's the ethos of it. Then there's the pathos, the use of emotional appeals, metaphor, amplification, storytelling. Those are all decisions that you make about what you're going to say, what words you're going to use. We're going to talk about figures of speech here in a little while. Um, the whether your voice increases or decreases, the amplification, uh, how you try to use certain words to engender emotions, you know, stories you tell, images you create, etc. Those are all ethos, and yet those are all part of this elocutio, this style. And then finally, logos, the use of reasoning, either inductive or deductive, to construct an argument. The reasoning that you present, the logic behind what your your Trying to persuade people of is based, is built out of what? The words you choose. And then how you present them. All of which is part of this, this aspect of it. Does that make sense? <coughs> Are we good with that? Any questions? The camera's on. I hope it's pointing in the right direction. Alright. So I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Elocutio. There are, I misspelled it up there, right? Sorry. There's not a middle T in there. Um, there are four aspects that were traditionally seen as being part of style or elocutio. The first of these is correctness, sometimes called purity. It means the words that are used should be current to popular language usage and used according to proper rules of grammar. If you stand up to offer a sermon or a uh, Bible study or anything else, 
and you have bad grammar, are they going to believe you? Probably not. Now that doesn't mean every, people can't split an infinitive every once in a while or whatever, but uh, or have a you know tense that doesn't match the reference or whatever. But in terms of general grammar, if you do not speak with proper grammar, then people are gonna that's going to grate against them, and they're going to be aware of that more than they're aware of what it is you're trying to persuade them of. Similarly, if you, when we talk about using words that are current to popular language, if you get up and start, unless you're at a Renaissance fair, and you get up and start speaking in Old English, they're not going to hear what you have to say because they're going to be freaked out by, why is he talking like that, or is she talking like that? So it has to be common, popular usage of language, and you need to make sure you use words in the right way. An example of that is when I had first year students that I was teaching preaching to. One of the first sermons that we got, the first year I did this, this young man, uh, first year student at seminary, got up and he's preaching about Jesus and he kept referring to him as Jesus the Nazarite. Jesus was not a Nazarite, he was a Nazarene. Nazarite was something completely different. The, the vow of the Nazarite was what John the Baptist and others took, where they agreed not to cut their hair and not to drink alcohol, etc., etc., as a spiritual pledge. Most people did it for a short period of time. The Apostle Paul, in Acts, we're told, was going through that for a while. John the Baptist was unusual because he apparently, his parents had pledged him to do it, and he stayed that in his whole life. That's what a Nazarite was. It's not Nazarene. It's not where Jesus was from. Well, those people in the who were listening to him, like me, every time he said Nazarite, we went... You know, well, did we hear much else of what he was saying since he kept using that word wrong? So, purity, correctness. Using the right words that are common to usage at that point. Don't, don't use the, you know, the, mistake the words. Don't use a language style that is completely out of uh, vogue right now. So, you need to be correct in what you say. And um, there are some things like this, and here we get into one, that somebody could say, well, you know, what if you do have bad grammar? Well, get over it. Learn good grammar. You can learn to speak better. If the problem is, a, is one in which you simply don't know any better, then you can learn. Now, when we get later on, when we talk about presentation, I may talk some about ticks and uh, ums and you know, that sort of thing, and we'll, we'll deal with talk about how you deal with some of that. But here we're talking about simply having a proper understanding and use of the language. And if you don't have that, if you plan on being somebody who communicates regularly, particularly if you're doing so as a representative of Jesus, then you need to try to make sure that you learn the language better. And there's no other way around that. And it's not easy. Um, I'll give you an example. When I, the work that I do, Carolyn and I have talked about this. I think she's had similar experiences. A lot of what I do is writing. And from time to time, a client, they would have somebody on their staff, and they would, they would say, well, you know, he or she is a really good writer. We're going to have them do a first draft, and we'll let you work with it. And they would send it to me, and it would be awful. Now, there were exceptions, but usually it was awful. Awful in, in a way that it's very difficult to explain what's wrong with it. <laughs> There was no transition between paragraphs. They would start an argument and then not finish it, leave it hanging out there in midair, and on and on and on. Well, the only way to get better at that is to practice. Um, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice. The you practice the written word. You you um, take classes, whatever. You need to learn to use the language well if you're ever going to be really good at this, Carolyn. Well, and you also have to be willing to be critiqued. Exactly. And I, I think you can't really learn on your own for a lot of that stuff. You don't know what you don't know. So That's very true. When I say you have to, you have to learn, then that it means taking classes or interacting, you know, having people interact with it, and that can be painful. It's hard to find somebody that you really trust enough to say this is really awful. Um, but sometimes you need somebody who loves you enough to say this is really awful, or this certainly could be better in order to get better. Okay? Um, there's really no way around being able to use correct language other than learning to use correct language. It's not, there's no magic pill that you can take. Is that fair? So that's hard to hear, but 
You're never going to be an effective communicator, either spoken or written, if you don't have a basic control of language, grammar, word usage. Okay? And some of it is, Carolyn's right, in terms of being taught it, being critiqued, learning that way. Some of it simply means making sure as you go along that you're not being lazy or sloppy with like using Nazarite instead of Nazarene. Do your homework. So that's something that has to be done ongoing as well. I'm sounding a little mean here, and I don't mean to be, but at a certain point, you just have to work it out. Okay? And get your band belt fixed. Whoever that is. Second, clearness. Clearness means the use of words in their ordinary, everyday, and understood sense. Another way to think of this one is uh, clearness or clarity is <coughs> your job here is not to impress somebody with your huge vocabulary. In fact, if that's what you're doing, then you're missing it. Clearness means you should be communicating in a way that everyone can understand. Now, if you're a writer and you're writing for publication, then the average reading level of Americans today is, is it sixth, Carolyn? Sixth grade. That's the average reading level. If you are writing for common consumption and you're writing at a university level, you're going to miss them. Carolyn? I'm not sure that that's really the average reading level, but it's, it's okay. what people understand easily without Without work, having work you, can have, you can have comprehension at, at a much, much higher level, but you're only comfortable. <laughs> that's true, and that's a good, a good uh, corrective. The difference between, um, you know, what's, what's your maximum level, I mean, what you could usually work at versus what, what you know you're going to be able to consume. And so from a marketing point of view, we say sixth grade level because we know everybody's going to get that, or with rare exception, everybody's going to get it. Now, I've had the experience... When I first moved to Washington State, I was living on Bainbridge Island, and I was looking for a church, and I visited a, an Anglican church on Bainbridge Island. There were only like 30 people in the congregation. And I think I have a pretty good vocabulary. I've told this story before, and yet the priest on that particular day preached a homily, and in a 15-minute homily, he used, I don't know, four or five words that I did not know the meaning to. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but if I don't know the meaning to those words, it's a pretty good chance there are a number of other people out of this 30 sitting right here, they don't know what that means either. And I'm sitting there thinking, who are you trying to impress? You know, do you, do you think that you get extra points if you can... I'm not going to answer that, sorry, it even goes on. Um, do you think you get extra points if you preach a sermon that has words in it people can't understand? Obviously not. So the goal is to not talk over people's heads, to not be too technical, and on the other end of the spectrum, to not use vocabulary that is too Christianese. You know, Christianese. If you use words that you know, that are very, that somebody who's not a Christian, who's not been raised in the church, that they're not going to understand, then you're missing it too. Now, there are, there are different settings, remember, appropriate to the audience. If you're dealing with, a, you know, a, a graduate level course in theology, then there's a level of assumption about understanding theological terms that you should be more comfortable with. But for the average church service, there, it's very possible. In many cases, depending on the community, it's, it's even probable that some people who are there are not church people. They just wandered in, or they've only been there a couple of weeks, and you start throwing out all these justification, sanctifications kind of stuff, without explaining them, you're not being clear. So, you got to be thinking about that. Not, not a don't try to show off a vocabulary that the average person cannot perceive. It doesn't necessarily have to be sixth grade, but it can't be, you know, post-post-doc kind of stuff. Don't use technical terms, and that includes don't use Christianese, and don't in any way try to talk over people's heads. The goal here is to communicate well, not to impress somebody. So be clear in the words you choose and how you present them. Fair? You do not get extra points for impressing somebody. Right? I make jokes about, even in our philosophy classes, or apologetics, I make jokes about ontological, teleological, cosmological, etc. But... I don't use those words in a sermon. And if I ever did for some reason, because I thought that was the only way to explain something, I would make darn sure I explain, here's what this means. Fair? I beat that one to death. Okay. Appropriateness. Appropriateness means to say or do whatever is fitting 
to a given situation. That particularly means use the words that are fitting to a situation. Um, and it means don't use words that aren't appropriate and use words in particular ways for emphasis. Be aware of the fact that words, different words have carry different emphases. Now the first part of that, don't use words that are inappropriate uh, for a given situation. Unless you are doing it for a specific effect, do not ever use a profanity in preaching or teaching for a specific effect. And I'll give you an example of that. I used the word damn, it was last class I think, because I was quoting somebody. And the, the point I was trying to make could not, did not make any sense without that word. But a perfect example of this is Tony Campolo. Do you know Dr. Tony Campolo from Eastern College, Pennsylvania? He is a widely, <coughs> he's gotten himself in all kinds of trouble because he's such a florid communicator that he sometimes goes so overboard that he's gotten in trouble and they questioned whether he should be speaking in public venues and all that. One of the things he's famous for, which I think is brilliant and very, very much to this point of appropriateness, is he one time was speaking on the number of children who were dying of preventable causes every day. And it was a much higher number right then. I was with World Vision at the time. And Tony Campolin speaking to, I think it was like a, a, I don't know if it was an university conference or a Young Life conference, a lot of younger people. And he said, 45,000 children are going to die today from preventable causes, and you don't give a shit. And you know why I know that? Because you're more concerned about the fact I just said shit than you are the fact that 45,000 children are going to die today from preventable causes. Now, do you see why that is an appropriate use of profanity? Not, not necessarily to be recommended. Tony Campola can pull that off when a lot of people couldn't. But that's the only kind of reason why a profanity would ever be used is because the very, the very nature of the word is what makes the point. Okay? Otherwise, don't go there. Don't do that. Um, also, don't use slang that is not commonly understood. And don't use words that would be considered biased words. You know, uh, gender references. You know, you don't refer to women as chicks when you're communicating this kind of way. Um, for example, and certainly no ethnic words that would be considered in any way even gray area, much less you know, the dark side. That's part of appropriateness, and you've got to pay attention to that stuff. And it's it's surprising how off, how how frequently those sorts of things slip through, okay? Um, so that's one aspect of the appropriateness for a given situation. The other recognition is that we use different words, that we use language differently at different times. Um, there's, there's a term that was used in rhetoric called kairos. Kairos is one of the two words, chronos and kairos are two <coughs> words that mean time. But kairos particularly means, in, in rhetoric, and I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a quote here, it means the passing instant when an open, opening appears which must be driven through with force if success is to be achieved. It means having an appropriate sense of what words to use at what times in your talk in order to get maximum effect. It's like having the timing to know when the punchline is, should be delivered. It is understanding that there is a climactic moment in a sermon in which you need to emphasize that that's the appropriate time to use certain words to draw your point most strongly, to make your point most strong. Does that make sense? So appropriateness means don't use inappropriate words, but it also means to recognize that certain language is should be used emphatically at certain times in order to really make the point you're trying to make. And they talk about that as kairos. Aristotle called Kairos the time and the space context in which you deliver the proof. The main point, to recognize that here's where I'm going to really hammer the point home, and to do so with particular language in a particular way. That's all part of appropriateness as well. Do you understand that? Any question about it? Now, is it a surprise to you all that you need to be this aware when you're preparing a lesson, a sermon, etc., that you need to think about which words you use and in what order and, and how you emphasize them? Yeah, I mean, it, 
when you've been doing this for a while, then this will come more naturally. You won't. The sermon that I gave you all last week, I did not sit down and take the outline of introduction, you know, proof, etc. But I've been doing it enough that that pretty much comes out that way. It's a fairly natural thing, as will be just just in the same way. Transitions from one paragraph to another, one thought to another in written material is one of my big bugaboos because it seems very few people that I've worked with get that right. It's like you have one thought and it ends and then you start a whole new thought and there's no connection. Um, well, I don't think about that anymore because when I write, because when I write, that's just something I've done for so long, I've been aware of for so long, I don't have to be aware of it all the time. You will get to that point too when it comes to, okay, here's where I need to make the big point. You don't need to draft something and go through, okay, what is the appropriate Kairos point at which I really need to hammer my, my main theme home? It will come through the development, but that's not to be assumed as being where you are right now. You may have to be very intentional about that for quite a long time before it starts to be something that you do more naturally. Is that understood? Just like in the last class, I was talking about the, the outlining, and in this class too, the recommendations they have for outlining a passage of scripture in order to get all the meaning out of it. Well, that seems like an awful lot of work. And yet, and if you do it, if you do that sort of uh, work, eventually you reach the place where you don't have to go through that mechanical kind of process. It will occur much more naturally and fluidly for you. But starting out, you need to be more aware, and you need to be more intentional than that, or it's not gonna work. And you will preach sermons like I've heard, or you will write things like I've read that simply don't flow. It doesn't. They don't move logically from one point to the next. You hear a sermon, and you and, and you've you've heard this. You get to the end, you go, I'm not sure what that was about. What was he trying to say, or she trying to say? Have you ever had that experience? Mm -hmm. Sometimes well, you've received a whole lot of very in interesting information. You say that was interesting, but but what's the point? Yes. Well, part of the appropriateness is the saying, knowing where you have to be very clear, here's the point. Even if you're doing, even if you have to say, okay, and the real point is, and then you tell them. But if you aren't intentionally conscious of this stuff, then you will be one of those, you're very possibly going to be one of those people that wanders around for half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, the, Carolyn and I, I'm not going to say who, but we, you know, we listened to a preacher some time ago at a different place, and I said, yeah, he had a 20-minute sermon, and he took 45 minutes to deliver it, you know, mm -hmm. because I just, I don't <coughs> think he had structured it, he wasn't working from notes, he was just talking off the top of his head. And it's one thing in a classroom setting, even, to, to deal with that, uh, but you don't do that in a sermon, you don't do that in a lesson. You're dealing with God's word. You've got to be more intentional in that. Okay, so appropriateness. The fourth thing, and this is considered by the discipline of rhetoric to be the most important, the last and most important of all of the elements of style, and that is ornament. Ornament is the use of language in unusual and extraordinary ways, especially by the use of figures of speech, figures of thought, and tropes. Figure of speech, I think you know what that means. That's, you know, similes, metaphors, etc. Figures of thought are kind of logical arguments where you build a, a logical or a thoughtful description or argument of something. Sometimes metaphors are also considered um, uh, crossover. In fact, a trope is where you exchange one word for another word that people know in order to make them think about it. In fact, metaphors often serve the function of tropes where you're saying, you know, um, well, where you're substituting a word for another word. I get caught in this situation, I won't think of good ones, but you get the idea. Now, all of these, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Well, figures of speech, I think you know. You know, uh, the, when peace like a river, you know, to quote the hymn, right? That's a simile, because it has a like in there. Peace like a river. An example of uh, figures of thought, where you're sort of exchanging one, one way of thinking about something with another way of thinking about something, or a logical argument. Um, I, when I was think, working through this, I thought the, the old, if we have any um, big time soap opera watchers, you remember like sands through the hourglass and so are the days of our lives. Now that's a metaphor, but it's also a figure of thought because you were replacing 
words with other words. Um, so there are a lot of different things you can do that. And we, the, this is the one that was considered most important because this is the part, the ornament of all the four pieces. The ornament is the one that brings you above the ordinary level of communication. To be very thoughtful about how you are going to use figures of speeches, illustrations, metaphor stories, all kinds of things. Narration, third party, um, third party stories, quotes, all of those are pieces of ornamentation that bring your speech, your lesson, your whatever, to the next level. They are the illustrations, the things that make people really think, the things they will remember later. All of those fit into ornamentation. Um, it also includes, by the way, the proper use, especially if you're writing, of punctuation and conjunctions, the use of uh, especially desirable or moving words. Um, when Abraham Lincoln gave perhaps one of the most famous speeches in the history of humanity, the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. If Abraham Lincoln had said 87 years ago, our country started, would we have remembered it this long ago? When, um, when Charles Dickens in Tale of Two Cities, when he starts it out, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the time, and he goes on. He could have said, it was both the best and worst of times. What's the difference in those? The recognition that the way you present the words, the way you communicate the thoughts, the words you select, especially the ornament, that th people said 87 back in Abraham Lincoln's time, but when he said four score and seven years ago, that was an ornamentation which made people remember it. That's not what you can do for your country. That's what your country can do for you. Yeah. The idea is what you need isn't as important as your country. If John Kennedy had said that, instead of asking not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, they would not have communicated nearly as much. So this ornamentation, figures of speech, ways of using words that are more powerful, um, various kinds of creative expression, that ornamentation is what lifts you above the day-to-day -day conversation. It's the difference between the kind of presentations you will make in homiletics and communication versus just a you know, talking to your next door neighbor over the fence. We can't do that, our fence is too high. But the idea, I have to go up to the mirror door to yell at them. Um, but you get, you get my point in that. C.S. Lewis had a great expression. He said, write with your ears. You get that? Write with your ears. What that means is, listen to the words that you are writing or that you are planning to speak. Hear them yourself and see if they ring for you. You know, when Abraham was, Lincoln was right, if he had sat down and, and written out 87 years ago, our nation's founders began our country, and he would have gone, boy, oh, that just doesn't sing. I, 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 I don't hear it. There's nothing there that excites me. In other words, he was listening. I'm making this up about him, by the way. I don't know if this is the process he went through. But then he realized that it just didn't sound, it didn't have the energy, it didn't sound the way he wanted it to sound. He was listening to his ears. He said, well, what if I said four score and seven years ago? That sounds better. Sounds better. He was writing with his ears. Again, I'm making that up about him, but I can pretty much guarantee anybody who writes something as powerful as the Gettysburg Address was writing with his ears, as Lewis was saying. Write so that you can hear the words singing the message you want to be. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And Lewis was a brilliant writer. He not only was a great scholar, but he was a great writer as well. So, well worth it. Um, okay, I've got something out of order here. Uh, I know what. All right. Now, related to this ornament, use of language in unusual or extraordinary ways. I actually, this is a slide I used before. You know, this is the, the thing we want to emphasize for a few minutes here, the ornament. <coughs> because again, that's the thing that brings you above the level. The assumption is you should use good grammar. You should use language that is appropriate and know when to make your primary points. The point, the, the assumption is you should be clear 
not talk over people's heads or use technical language or whatever. Those should be givens whatever you do. But the ornament is the thing that will make you over and above, that will really affect people, that will make them remember and listen to things. You know, when the Reverend Dr. King said, I had a dream, that whole imagery in that, I had a dream, there was no, to me that was, that's the ideal model of what a sermon should be because there was no factual content he communicated. He, and he, he dreams of a time when my children are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, one thing is, color of their skin, content of their character, that is an alliteration. We're going to mention that in a minute. The use of words that not, that because you're writing with your ears, the sound of them is part of what the impact is. One of my favorite poets, even though some scholars I know laugh at me when I say this, is Edgar Allan Poe. And not because of the deep content of his poetry, but because of his use of the language. You know, like in, in The Raven. He's talking about, and each silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic feelings never felt before. Do you hear all that alliteration in there? That his very use of those sounds is so powerful. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming. Do you hear all that alliteration? And the lamplight or in streaming casts a shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. All of that sound is what I love about a ground pole. Right? I did the raven in oral turkey. <laughs> so, ornament. Um, I used this slide before because this is all related to ornament, which is again the most, uh, traditionally is considered the most important, the most, uh, the, the, having the biggest impact of anything else in an elocutio. And it is using the imagination in various ways. Imagination can make an otherwise dull sermon come alive by bringing hidden realities into view, setting familiar faces and fresh relationships seeing resemblances and implications which escape the casual observer. This is what all of the, all of the color, the alliteration, the, the, uh, the various kinds of word tools, figures of speech, figures of thought, that's what these all do. Example of visualization, that doesn't mean a skier who's picturing the room, right? It means inserting a dramatic de set of details that makes people see or visualize what it is you're talking about. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the palabus. You know, the picture, the su a supposition, a hypothetical illustration that can be effective uh, and helpful as a true incident. Have you ever had the, the situation where you're driving down the road, okay, it's a hypothetical. Have you ever had? Did you ever think? Those are all hypothetical situations, but it causes people to be able to visualize or picture themselves in a situation. Parables, Jesus is very common tool. A parable is simply a story that has a point, a moral or ethical or religious point. <clears throat> Figures of speech, similes, analogies, metaphors, etc. Um, all of these are critical aspects of using ornamentation in your language that sets you apart. Um, I told you the story that John Hullen, our, our communications teacher who helped with uh, people in preaching, he always said the only unforgivable sin for a preacher is to be boring. And how could you be boring when you're telling the story of God having come to earth as a human being and lived and died and resurrected physically and ascended to heaven and coming again? How can that be boring unless you don't really believe it's true? Well, it can also be boring, I think, if people don't work at it. If they don't think about how you communicate that in a way that has color and energy and vibrancy and people can see it and, and hear it, right? all of those happen because of ornamentation in our talks. Right? Choosing the right words and then using them at the right time in your talk and in the right way. Any questions or comments about that so far? I'm actually going to wear you out with 20 different kinds of figures of speech in a moment, but, and then talk about some other kind of uh, presentation-related questions. Yes, Chris. Well, 
Okay, so you have all this information. You're going to sit down and actually write your sermon. So you actually, I mean, you've got more experience, but generally, you have to actually sit around, get a thesaurus, look up words that, I mean, you really have to put basically a lot of effort to make some of this stuff happen, right? Well, I sometimes use a thesaurus if I think, okay, I've used that word twice in two previous sentences, right. but I don't, look, I don't ever look up words because I want to find a big word. Right. Sometimes a simpler word or a different word for the same thing. Now, for me, it's a matter that uh, I will write the sermon, and then as I go back to it, I, I will recognize that some place is dry. And one of the first things I do is I'll break it up into multiple paragraphs. And then decide what do I, you know, because frequently if something gets right because you're going on too long in one place. The simple thing of breaking a long passage in, or paragraph into two, and then think about, okay, how do I illustrate these better? Um, the sermon that I gave you all, the expression, which you laughed at when I used it, I thought of after the sermon had been written and I hand wrote it in. I, I typed it in for your version, but the idea about, you know, does that make any sense to you? As we say in the South, that dog won't hunt. Right. That dog won't hunt. Southern expression, people laughed at it when I said it in, the, in the, there as well. It is an illustration. It, it's a very appropriate. I didn't just say, how can I fit this in? Right. That dog won't hunt is kind of a cute expression. I got to that point, and the point I was trying to make is that makes no sense. It simply doesn't work logically. And instead of saying, that makes no sense, it doesn't work logically, although I said that in various ways, I said, as we say in the South, that dog won't hunt. Well, there's an example of using an ornamentation to emphasize that point. Um, so much of it will, will you, you have the, the theme, you have the passage, the text, you design what your basic structure should be. Those are all the things we talked about before. You begin to, to my, in my process, I will sit down and write it, and having done this a lot, most of what comes out first will include some color and illustrations, and I'll think of this stuff as I'm writing. Oh, I remember, you know, Howard Hendricks told that story about the two Jehovah's Witnesses that came, okay, or third party story, uh, or a quote, or whatever. But then I will go back and I will read all of it again. And if there are places that need to, that need strengthening, that are too dry, that I need illustration for, then I'll consciously think about, okay, how can I illustrate that point? And in some cases, you know, there are tools. You can get books of quotes, you know, books of illustrations, sermon illustration volumes are available, et cetera, et cetera. You can go to those. The goal would be to get comfortable enough with this that you don't have to use those kinds of things because there's always a danger that if you use somebody else's stuff like that, that it becomes unnatural that it feels awkward or forced. Whereas if there are things that you've experienced or just things that you remember off the top of your head, that means you've internalized them. And if you've internalized them, even if they're a story about somebody else, they're going to come across as more natural. All right? Yeah. So sometimes the ornamentation especially, the color part, will come in later. Again, the more you do this, the more that stuff will flow out of you as you go along. But you can always go back and review what you've written two or three or four times. I will go through any number of times once I have basically the final draft done. I will still go through and several times and we'll be adding things and saying, well, that doesn't work. And I'll, before on Sunday morning, before I actually preach, if I show you my notes, I'll go, you know, that paragraph's not necessary. And I'll be marking stuff out right before I go. <coughs> Uh, or I may, may think of something, and you know, I may think of an illustration, and I'll just make a quick note, Howard Hendricks story, and use that when I get up there. So, any other questions about that? Let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back. <laughs> Got two more things I want us to do today, and first is I want to talk about figures of speech. And I'm going to give you 20 different kinds of figures of speech. Now, if you think that sounds like a lot, in the Renaissance, they had identified 183 different kinds of figures of speech. They got way carried away in the Renaissance. Um, but this 20, and some of these you will never have heard of, I'm pretty sure. Some of them you'll, you know, it'll be obvious. Um, I've got examples for some of them. Some of them, as I was preparing for this, I thought, I can't think of a good example of that right now. Maybe you guys can help. Um, so the top 20 figures of speech. Alliteration. I just gave you a great example of that. It's the repetition of initial consonant sounds. Any silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain. Um, 
So alliteration, anaphora, repetition of the same word or phrase at the beginning of, of, of juxtaposition of successive, excuse me, clauses or verses. Um, an example of that might be, hear ye, all ye people, hear ye, come forward and hear, hear ye, so that you're, you know, you're using for emphasis something of that sort. Antithesis is a juxtaposition of contrasting ideas and imbalanced phrases. Um, you know, the Lord God judges those who do ill, the Lord God blesses those who do well, you know, that kind of thing, so that they're opposites and they're used to balance out each other. An apostrophe, breaking off of discourse to address some absent person or thing, some abstract quality, an inanimate object, or a non-existent character. Think Hamlet. You know, Hamlet goes into these soliloquies, and in doing so, he's speaking to, um, to the ghost, or to his father, or whatever, and then he'll come back into it. And so, that's a, an apostrophe would be sort of like a parenthetical expression that occurs in the middle of something else. <coughs> And um, assonance, identity or similarity in sound between internal vowels in neighboring words. Um, Looney Tunes. The oo in that Looney Tunes or um, thrilled me, filled me. It's not an alliteration because it doesn't start with the same sound, but it's got the same internal sound. So that's the difference there. Um, chiasmus, a verbal pattern in which the second half of an expression is balanced against the first half, with, but with parts reversed. Um, <coughs> this happens in scripture a lot. The book of Daniel is the whole book is a chiasmic structure, which means it, it builds points and then it reverses those points. Uh, and the same thing can happen in a chiasmic expression where you make a point and then you, it's sort of like the, a wave goes in and then it comes back out again, covering the same material. Um, can't think, I don't know of one, I can't think of one that's just two, two expressions. A euphemism, the substitution of an inoffensive term for one considered offensively explicit. Um, there, the F word. The F word. Right, <laughs> there's, there's a, a, a euphemism. The F word. Um, often those are sexual things or, or sometimes they would be um, uh, racial epithets, that sort of thing. Hyperbole, an extravagant statement, use, uh, use of exaggerated terms for purpose of emphasis or heightened effect. Be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, he, you know, he reached for the stars. Well, he didn't literally. That's hyperbole. Um, oh. Mine, mine did it too. It's, it's my first day with this phone. Oh, <laughs> in fact, I couldn't make a call earlier. <laughs> And by the way, I just remembered what you you this remind me. Carolyn gave me a, a very useful corrective at the break when I talked about using profanities. I, that's the wrong word. Vulgarity is the word I meant. Mm -hmm. The difference in a profanity and a vulgarity. A profanity is actually to say something profane, which means against God or against holiness. Uh, vulgarity is bodily functions or you know that that sort of thing. So I correct. I stand corrected. I was, there probably is never a time it's appropriate to use a profanity in that sense, you know, which is again a reference to uh, like GD or something of that sort, but a vulgarity, which is a bodily function, like my, the quote I used for, um, for Tony Campolo, um, so correct, correct it there. Uh, number nine, irony, the use of words to convey the opposite of their literal meaning, a statement or situation where the meaning is contradicted by the appearance or presentation of the idea. Um, I read a thing recently that there was this a philologist, a word expert, and he said, you know, it's been fairly common in, um, in languages to use two negatives to indicate a positive. But it's never been the case where you use two positives to indicate a negative. One of the students in, the, in, in his classroom said, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> two positives that indicate a negative. That's an example of irony because, yeah, right, is, it's not right. You know, you're saying that's your way of saying it's wrong or I, incorrect. Yes? I just read today that the opposite of irony is wrinkly. <laughs> <laughs> Humor. <laughs> Um, then there's litotes, the figure of speech consistent, uh, consisting of an understatement in which an affirmative is expressed by negating its opposite. That's what's called being damned by faint praise. You know that expression? If you say of somebody, you know, um, somebody has just given a speech, uh, oh, I'll, I'll give you a real example. Um, Frank Zappa, before his death, 
was he was a new it was a New Year celebration. He was one of the sort of guest stars, and some rapper came out, and you know he does this rap song and it was pretty awful. And he that was when it was a big deal then that you didn't lace up your shoes, you know. And so the other that sort of anchor turned to Frank Zappa and said, "So what did you think of the performance?" And he said, "I think his shoes are cool." <laughs> That's damned by faint praise, meaning he didn't say anything about the song. He made a comment about, well, I think his shoes are cool, which is an understatement saying, but the rest of it you can forget about. That's what damned by, by faint praise means, and that's Latotes. Um, metaphor and implied comparison between two unlike things that actually have something important in common. Now, the difference in a metaphor and a simile, which we'll get to in a minute, is a metaphor says something is something else. A simile says it's like something else, or it's similar to. That's where simile comes from. That's the difference. You know, um, peace like a river is a simile because it's got a like in there. You know, um, he was, well, I can't even think of a good metaphor right now. And that's the most common one. Metaphor is the most common figure of speech there is. Uh, um, metonymy. Metonymy is a figure of speech in which one word or phrase is substituted for another, which is closely associated with, also a rhetorical strategy of describing something indirectly. If I were a race car driver and I said, I'm racing in the Monte Carlo this year, you'd know what I meant, right? That's not the name of it. When I said in the Monte Carlo, that's just, you'll know that I mean the Grand Prix event, which is held in Monte Carlo, right? Um, Aromatopoeia, the use of words that imitate the sounds associated with the objects or actions they refer to. Again, Edgar Allan Poe, his, his poem, The Bells, and the ringing and the dinging of the bells. You know, he's got the ringing and the dinging, and then he talks about the big bells, you know, you know the, the bonging and the donging of the bells. And so that's onomatopoeia because the sounds of the words represent the sound that's actually being talked about. Uh, oxymoron. A figure of speech in which it's uh, incongruous or contradictory terms appear side by side. Military intelligence is one they always used to refer to in, in MASH. Uh, jumbo shrimp, those are all oxymorons, two words that don't seem they ought to go together, and yet we put them together. Um, paradox, a statement that's, that appears to say contrary things. When we say Jesus was fully God and fully man, that's a paradox. It is not actually a contradiction. We are not saying he was fully man and yet he wasn't a man at all. That would be a contradiction. Fully God and fully man, a statement of two things, which we don't, it's not immediately evident how both those things can occur. They seem to be incompatible. Perhaps incompatible is better than word than contrary. But we believe them both to be true. That's a paradox. All right? Um, stop me if you've got any questions about this or if you, if you think of any brilliant examples. Um, Personification, a figure of speech in which an inanimate object or abstraction is endowed with human qualities. Um, my unread textbook just sat there scowling at me. Yeah. <laughs> There's personification. As it did for all of us, I see everybody is lying. <laughs> sometimes it jumps out at us. <laughs> Pun, a play on words, sometimes on different senses of the same word, sometimes on the similar sense or sound of different words. Anybody think of a good pun? You never think of it when you try, right? Yeah. We we should know because we had a friend George who was who was just the consummate punster. He was always making jokes about uh, about well, about the one. Um, he was he came over and he was going to watch a movie with us one time, and our, our TV was downstairs in the family room. And Carolyn comes downstairs and she's carrying a flower pot. And George says, "She brought the pot, man." <laughs> <laughs> That's a pun. Yeah. And he did that all the time. Um, if you don't understand what that means, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> uh, simile. Again, a stated comparison usually formed with like or as between two fundamentally dissimilar things. Peace like a river is the example that I thought of. Um, Synecdoche is a figure of speech in which a part is used to represent the whole. ABCs for alphabet is a good example of that. Right? Um, it's just an abbreviation sort of thing. And then an understatement, a figure of speech in which a writer or a speaker deliberately makes the situation seem less important or serious than it is. Okay, understatement. You guys understand. Get those. Any questions about any of those? All of those are fair game. Now, if you say, I want to figure out a way to use a, um, a, a, 
a personification in here or a okay, I'm going to figure out how to put that in there, then you're doing it wrong. These have to be things that, that arise as you are going, as you think of them. Um, and the more, I'll tell you this too, because we talk about quotes and things like that, the more you read, the more these things will come to you. Um, I memorize some poetry, memorize scripture, um, read more stuff. The biggest limitation that people in our culture have for not being able to use ornamental language like this is they haven't read enough to have been exposed to it. Okay, it's, it's as simple as that. Read everything. I can remember when my kids were quite small and, and my father-in-law was very ill and we had a like, three-hour drive to get there and I'm like, every weekend for months. And so what do you do with two little kids in the car who are, you know, not wanting to face the traffic? And so we did some of these sort of figures of speech things and to this day my kids love alliterations. Yeah, I mean, they just delight and they giggle at yeah. you know, and nothing like having a 40 year old man giggle because he's just made a whole argument or statement all using alliteration. Yeah. And he'd say, right well, up. <laughs> and there are great games. Uh, yeah. the Tom Swifties. Are you familiar with Tom Swifties? <laughs> Carolyn, give him a couple of Tom Swifties. Um, my family loved these. It was, you know, um, Oh, I, I fell on the ground. Tom said flatly. You know that was it was sort of from the from some books, I guess. And we we make them up and get more and more elaborate. My sister had one. I've lost my voice. The crow said without cause. Oh. <laughs> I, I made the longest one though. Frankly, I don't relish the thought of touring a hot dog factory. Tourists. The Tom said. Um, as he, mustered his As he mustered his courage and tried to catch up. <laughs> okay, did you get that? Say it again. Frankly, I don't relish, relish to, the thought of touring the hot dog factory, Tom said, as he mustered his courage and tried to catch up. Okay. These are, uh, and those are great. Those are little, puns. Yeah, they're <laughs> puns. Put together. But they're great. To, to learn to play with language like that gives you the skill to be able to use it not only in fun, but also in serious, too. And there's always a Tom in there because they're called Tom Swifties. They're all about Tom. And, and, and all the pieces, frankly, okay, sausage factory, um, hot dog factory, whatever. All right, I want to talk for a few minutes now about some good communication techniques as you're doing this, some other kind of things you can do to increase ornamentation to, to communicate uh, effectively without having names on all of these. First, use common points to build a rapport. That simply means there's always too much of a danger that when somebody hears a preacher especially, it's, there's this chasm. He's up there, we're down here. Is he talking in a language we don't even understand? And so part of the cha challenge, part of the task, is to be able to relate to the people or cause them to relate to you. And a common way to do that is to say, well, I'm sure you've experienced what it's like when to identify common experiences, common points of experience, history, whatever. We were all here when this church was just whatever. So common points in order to build rapport. Recognizing that that addresses the very real thing that some people feel there's always going to be a distance between the person standing in the pulpit and them. Right? To draw illustrations from things that are commonly understood, including movies, stories, songs, books. This morning in the first class, I said, you know, spun my head around like Linda Blair. And I didn't even think about it at the time. Well, you have to be careful because there are people around today who don't know that reference. Does anybody not know what I mean when I say spun my head around like Linda Blair? <laughs> the Exorcist. There's a scene in The Exorcist when she's possessed and her head does a 360, you know. Oh, okay. um, so you have to be a little bit careful, but references to movies, stories, songs, books, um, that people can, you know, they'll immediately be able to picture what you're talking about. It can be very powerful very effective. Now, if you, you know, well, as Franz Kafka said in The Metamorphosis or whatever, yeah, you're going to be struggling with that one, so be careful. Um, but Harry Potter reference, you know, things that people that are commonly understood, uh, or, and especially if there are new movies that are out or new books that are out that everybody's talking about, you know, Noah or The Exodus, whatever. Use a we focus, especially when you're talking about negatives. Don't 
Don't ever make the mistake of standing up there and saying, you people you know, have too much of a tendency to sin whenever you're tempted by, because the finger wagging is going to be felt even if it's not actually happening. If you say we have too much of a tendency to fall into sin because of blah, 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 it's a completely different experience. You make the same point, but by including yourself in it, then you all, they don't feel, they don't get defensive because you're doing it by way of confession and assuming that you're being sensible and that it's a reasonable point, then you can communicate. But you start, you start saying the use on something negative and you're gonna lose them. Marvin. A friend of mine used to sing, I was deep, sing, deep in sin. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> was it anybody here, was it? Gerald? No. Okay. Um, avoid huge generalizations. And this is something because it doesn't ring true with people. No one has ever, or everyone is, no. You might, if you want to make that point, you might say, sometimes it feels as though everyone is. And you can make the same point without it bringing faults to people. Um, so avoid huge generalizations of any kind. You know, I told you once, I told you a billion times. Don't exaggerate. Don't exaggerate. <laughs> use quotes for credibility. You saw that quite a bit. In fact, I used so many quotes in that sermon I gave you last week that I actually had a had a statement in there. You know, I, I warned them I was going to do this. I gave myself permission by saying. You know, because of the nature of this, and uh, the fact that there are real experts available, I'm going to use more quotes than usual. But using a quote, and use them with discretion. You know, use them appropriately. Don't, don't just string five pages worth of quotes, quotes together and think that's going to do it. Uh, but a quote from an expert can be very powerful because it's, it, there's a credibility that immediately occurs with that. Okay? Uh, use rhetorical questions to engage your audience. Um, does that make sense to you? Are you asking audience? And again, I did that in that sermon. I laid out all of the sort of what seemed to be the facts, and I go, did, now, does that make sense to you? Does that sound right to you? That's a rhetorical question. Obviously, I know what I think the answer is. The answer is no, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't sound right. And by getting by asking that question, I get them to go, no, it doesn't. And they then are persuaded to the point of strategy. Right? Um, tell a third person story. I told you the Howard Hendricks story earlier with Jehovah's Witnesses. There is something because you're stepping outside yourself and it's not just you that's had that experience. A third person story can be very powerful, that kind of narrative. Um, and that also, by the way, can, can be a credibility thing. If you tell a story about Howard Hendricks, who's one of the foremost New Testament scholars of the last generation, um, there's a credibility to that as well as you're telling somebody else's story and what they experienced. Repeat the key message, especially at the end. Um, remember the thing about tell them, tell them what you told them, and then uh, tell them, and you tell them, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So repeating the key message at the end. It doesn't have to be with a great flourish. And this, this in fact, is where some of your own personal style uh, will, will need to get developed. My style, if I could call it that, is that I tend to go low key at the end. You know, I'll, I, I will sort of build, uh, I hope, <laughs> build my points and make the point and say, and this is the, you know, this is critical thing. But then I usually finish on a fairly low key, and I'll the series I'm doing right now, for instance, I'll go, you know, that is what we mean by the resurrection. That's why we believe it. Amen. So I'm just basically, I make that's the key message. We believe this is true, and, and this is why. But I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't usually use a flourish at the end, and that's just a matter of personal, personal style. Some people would. I mean, some, some rhetoricians would say you need to make that a bigger deal at the end, sort of restate. And so clearly, it's evident from everything we can say and do that the resurrection absolutely was a historical event that we can put our faith in. My style is a little different than that, and maybe I could do better, but, but you get the idea. So, re re repeat the key message, especially at the end. And, and two, um, here I'm saying all the things you need to do. 
you do have to find your own style. Because earlier I said that that if you are using an illustration, if you go look one up from the Book of Bible illustrations, and, the, and you stick that in there, it's not always going to be true. But there's always a danger that it's not going to it's not going to flow. It's not going to sound like you. It's not going to fit because either it didn't happen to you, which is it's easy to make something sound like you if it happened to you, but Often if it's something you've heard or read and you've internalized it, then the way it's going to come back out is going to sound more true because it is something that's come from inside you rather than something you just lifted off of a page of a book you just saw. Um, all of that has to do with your own personal style. The longer you do it, the more comfortable you will get with um, having expressions, using ornamentation, using figures of speech that feel natural to you because they are who you are. That's all part of your style. You don't develop a style immediately. It takes time. You've got to do this stuff. I don't think I had whatever I might have considered my style when I started preaching five and a half years ago. I don't think it was at all what I'm like now. Do you think that's true, Carolyn? I don't know. Okay. I think I probably am very different in my style because I've worked this four years now. Um, it You're takes different time. than you were three years ago. Okay. <laughs> And some of that has to do with what the top, you know, what the series is or topic is or whatever. So, um, so then signal that you're closing and then close. I hate it when somebody says, and my final point is, and then they go on for 20 more minutes. You know, well, you, you sort of probably the bigger message there is don't do something irritating because they're only going to remember how how irritated they were that. You said you were leaving, and I was I'm hungry, and I was looking forward to getting home to, to, to lunch, and then you kept going for 20 or 30 more minutes. So, and, and all that is, is, and my final point, and the final thing I think we need to remember, and, um, you know, give them some indication that you're gathering yourself to the finish, and they need to, too. Partly because that means that whatever you say after you give that indication of the close should be important. That should be the summing up, the conclusion that we talked about when we were talking about structure last week. Um, and But when you then do that, when you give that indication, then do move with some alacrity toward your conclusion, your close. Don't say, you know, and my final point is, and then have three more points after that. Because you just tick them off, and they're mean. <laughs> okay? Number 10, leave them with one key takeaway message. This is one of the reasons why, like in this series, I will finish with something as simple as, this is what the resurrection is, and this is why we believe it. Because the whole theme is why we believe the whatever it is. And so my takeaway has been, this is why we think it's completely reasonable to think that the Bible really is the Word of God. I just come right out there and say that. Um, and so however you do that, you want to communicate a very clear kind of message. That here's, here's the thing you need to take away from this. Here's the, here's the part. You forget everything else you want to remember. You know what I find in the series you're doing now is that you build up, you build up, you build up. There's a, a climax, a, a, a big statement. Um, that it's obvious, it's amazing, it's true. and. and there it is, all laid out to you, the truth, the reality, the how we got there, everything. And then that final closing is just a slow, quiet down lake. Yeah. We're closing the door and so out the door. You know, it's it's just it's just a nice Well good. I'm glad it works that way. Because that, yeah, again, that's my style is that I don't want to have a big flourish at the end. That's not how I think that it's not doesn't feel right to me. That's what style is, is how do you naturally feel to do it? Um, and I appreciate that. I had one person that's, that's interesting. He said to me at the break after the uh, Why We Believe in the Trinity, he said, you know, Ross, you presented all that stuff, and it's so obvious what the Trinity is and why we believe is it, it, in it. Why do people have trouble with that? You know, which I took as a great compliment. And I said, they're just not as smart as us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how else do I respond to something? And I said, no, I mean, people who have, who have bias. You cannot argue people into a belief like that if they have a bias that they're not going to listen to it in the first place. So. Well, a lot of people you can't touch it, see it, smell it, hear it kind of thing. Materialism. Uh, yes. It's just not there. Yeah. 
Any questions or comments about any of those? Are these things helpful when I do mm -hmm. when I do this? Absolutely. Uh, I've done this several times and probably will continue to. Um, in the absence of actually making you get up here and do a sermon and having critiques, this is the this is my approach, which we will do in the in the preparation for ministry class or, or seminar. But this is my way of sort of giving you some practical pointers. Anything else? I'm finished. You guys get an extra half hour. Oh.